to Good Morning. I'm Corey White. Thank you all for joining. And, and this is Lauren. She's helping out. She's setting up our, our, our presentation slash demo. Uh, we're talking about prevention as, as a business strategy. You know, briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about my background uh, and experience. I've been you know, in the security consulting space for the last 22 years. So I've been around, seen a lot of things happening. Uh, right now, I'm SVP of the global consulting business at Silence, and Silence is a company that's focused on preventing cyber attacks. And, and on top of that, the consulting side of the house where we do incident you know, containment response. So I'm going to go through some of the live examples of what we've dealt with as it relates to security incidents that we've seen in, in, in the past year or so, Corey. give a full breakdown. Corey, um, I actually... <laughs> so we're, we're going to do a ransomware demo. Um, I might have to pull out my laptop. Um, it looks like it encrypted. Well, for the purpose of you guys, uh, can we make this? Well, I guess you can't make it bigger, but this is what a ransomware message looks like. Um, it actually pops up. If you have anybody ever dealt with a ransomware incident before? A few. Well, I, I'll read kind of what it, what it says here. Um, all the files on the host and the network have been encrypted with strong algorithm, and it, it can, cannot be decrypted. Luckily, I'll, I'll get my laptop in a second here. Um, and it says, do not shut down or reset. Your files may be damaged or renamed. Uh, probably in the background on this VM, it's probably just encrypting all the files. Like we showed the processor, it showed that it is uh, you know, going pretty quickly. So. Give us a second to go and, and, and get an, another laptop and pull this bike up. I work for Silence. We actually stop cyber attacks like this. <laughs> Ransomware doesn't actually execute. So we're going to switch to the actual presentation and show you what we actually see with um, uh, real world ransomwares. Um, that actually was a ransomware from one of you know, our um, you know, now customers. They have incidents. They get encrypted, we come in and get them contained. So we'll, we'll switch to a demo real quick. And Lauren, you want to walk through? Actually, before I, I start talking, oh. I'll let you walk through oh. what a ransomware incident looks like in detail. Uh, Lauren's one of our incident response consultants. So this particular strain of ransomware is called BitPamer. And the reason why BitPamer is so lethal is that it essentially hides itself as soon as it executes on your system. So it's virtually basically untraceable. Um, if we were to open the task manager right now, it would not show up as running any processes out of the ordinary. So there wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary running. And this is because, so, okay, so I'll go into a little bit of file basics. So a file is essentially a stream of bytes so in other words, uh, kind of like a sequence of bytes all grouped together. And so this would be called, so a regular file would be a main file stream. And it also contains um, other alternate data streams. And so an alternate data stream is basically a hidden part of the file that's not usually shown in, I guess, like the task manager or um, in any of the file browsers. So it's not usually found. Um, and so the reason why BitPamer is so lethal is because when it executes, it deletes the executable. As you can see here, it's gone after I clicked on it. It's completely gone because it has split into various little copies in all alternate data streams. And so they are basically um, untraceable and they are all in hidden files. So it is very difficult to find them and to see what is going on at the time. And what it does with these alternate data streams is so ransomware normally receives its, um, I guess, like controls on what to do next from a server that's usually remote, and the attacker will be running that server and giving each piece of ransomware the different commands it needs to do. For example, if it needs to download any other files or if it needs to start encrypting the machine, then the attacker would send that code to that ransomware um, and basically give it instructions. So you could essentially have a piece of ransomware on your system that is completely dormant and it has not received instructions yet. And it's just waiting for instruction before it can run. And so with BitPamer, all the little pieces of the file that are running at the time that are encrypting and 
uh, embedding itself into your system are receiving different controls from the command and control servers. And so what happens is the attacker will just send those little pieces of code and the instructions to all those different little pieces of the ransomware that are running on the system. And so what it did while we were waiting there, it was probably encrypting everything. Um, as you can see, it adds a, I don't know if you can see that far, but it adds a dot locked um, extension to it. And basically that means it's been encrypted or locked up so you won't be able to open it. You can try to open it right now and it will not open. Okay, thank you for that explanation. So now we'll, we'll switch to, to the actual presentation. So when you think about preventing these types of attacks, you have to have uh, a way to stop it from ever executing. If a detect and respond you know, type of tools in place, then it's gonna execute. So you know, a traditional antivirus is, is gonna ultimately be not the solution you want because it's still gonna execute uh, on that system. So we talk about the evolution of getting to a prevention as a business strategy, but now we're going to deep dive ransomware a lot more and what it really looks like in some of the cases we've dealt with. And I'll, I'll click through. So before we get into that, you know, we've just talked about prevention, what it, what it actually means to you. Uh, I, I want you to think about that first and we'll finish off with what we see real world. So. There are actually more than 4,000 ransomware attacks every single day. And that's grown you know, from 2015, and it's going to continue to grow because it is just a simply a way to make money. You know, we all have our day jobs, but with ransomware, there's so much money you can make. There's a new attack every 14 seconds you know, based upon the statistics and trends that we're seeing today. And so $11 billion annually, some of the real stats here that we see. This is an interesting one for me. You think about, it takes 150 days for someone to detect that they are compromised. I come from a pen test background. You give me 150 days, then I'm going to get into anything into your system. Give me a couple days, I'm fully into your system. But what that means is most companies don't know that they are actually are compromised until they, something bad really happens or it manifests it itself. So, this is a, from a real ransomware case. This is a pop-up that, that um, one of our future clients ended up getting. A few things I'll point out. This was back in May, 5-15-2017. Uh, uh, he had, what, four days you know, to, to pay the ransom or his files would be lost. Now, if you think about it, these, these guys, they're sending these out to multiple you know, people. The ransomware, as, as a service is out there, you can download the full toolkit for free. Only thing you need to provide is the email addresses. You provide the email addresses and blast it out, and this is going to start popping up. And as Lauren mentioned, you get the command and control. Now, interesting piece, if you can't read in the back, I'll read what it says here. I've already sent, sent decryption keys to many customers who have sent me the correct amounts in Bitcoin, and I guarantee the decryptions for such honest customers. Send me a message with your unique Bitcoin wallet address an hour before payment, then you will receive decryption key more quickly. Now, what is interesting, this is a business. They cannot not decrypt your files. Because if that, if that were a trend, then no one is going to pay the ransom because, hey, you didn't decrypt my files. So they always pay. I've yet to see, you know, see when you pay and then they don't send the decryption key. They will always give you that decryption key. Yeah, the, and the next piece to it is, if you notice down here, again, back in May, $600 worth of Bitcoin to this address. How much is 600 in Bitcoin worth today? Anybody know? Well, I Googled it. Hopefully, I did it right. Um, that's what Google says. Nice little conversion there. You see it increasing <laughs> at the end of 20, 2017. That's a ton of money. I'm in the wrong job. I don't know what you guys are doing, but I'm in the wrong job. I could be somewhere, you know, you know, have my yacht in the Mediterranean Sea off of Malta somewhere. I could be there. But instead, I have this job. I'm a good guy on the right side of it. Uh, but I want my $6 million. So 
We did 330 cases of ransomware last year. That many incidents you know, came to our incident response team. And you know, I'll give one example of, of a pretty large one. It was, it, was, it was a law firm, and uh, it always do these do over holiday. This was, um, I want to say it was Memorial Day weekend. But they encrypted the whole law firm's files. That next Tuesday, they had to litigate cases. They asked for $1 million. These guys were, you know, had you know, equity lines of credits on their houses that they were going to the bank to get to pay this off. Uh, and we actually had to float them and say, okay, they couldn't get us the money in time. We downloaded a couple files from, from the hackers to verify, is this really your file? And so the partner said, hey, download this file. This is for the case. You know, and if they, if they actually have that, then I need to litigate this on Tuesday. If not, I will lose this case. So we downloaded it, verified that they were going to actually give their files. And we verified with them, do you really want to pay this? And they said yes. We negotiated with the hackers. We got them down to around $900,000. Know, and we paid it. And then they paid us back you know, to, to cover the incident. So this is a real deal. People are paying you know, very large amounts for, for ransomware to get it contained. You've got to figure out a way to be able to prevent it. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. So. One million Bitcoin were paid in 2018 you know, from our side to contain incidents. Now, that is not including the million dollars we just talked about for that one case. I actually excluded that. These were all the little cases. So it was almost really you know, two million that, that we paid to contain you know, those, those incidents. Oh, my bad. Sorry. This is 2018. Already this year, we paid that. Sorry. Uh, already this year, we have paid that. It's, we're one month in to help contain these incidents. This is how bad of a problem that this is. So, you know, high level, how it works, I'm gonna talk through you know, a couple incidents. The entry point is, is important. It could be a phishing email, it could be an attachment, it could sometimes it could even be a website you go to and something gets downloaded to your computer. But once it, it actually executes, some of the more sophisticated ransomware, and I'll go through some of the ransomware families, you know, their goal is to delete all your backups or they target specific industries. Yeah, and there are certain ones that go just after hospitals because they have to pay. But going through this, once it's installed, the encryption happens, and then the extortion, you know, as Lauren described. So what makes you vulnerable? Your know, lack of a formal backup plan. You know, backups are increasingly being targeted, especially in 2017. We saw that as a trend to where the hackers hack in and they attack your backups. Because it used to be you're like, well, mm, okay, I'm not going to pay the ransom because I got a good backup. And so the ransom were, you know, the hackers weren't getting paid. So they fixed that in some of their malware to delete the backups. You know, we've seen several companies, because they didn't think they were a target, they said, we don't have a cybersecurity strategy at all. We don't need it because we're not a target. Nobody's going to come from us. But ransomware was interesting. You, you think about the cost of us to do an incident um, for on, on the smaller end. They'll charge two to three thousand know, dollars. And you know, it costs more for us to come in sometimes and contain it than to just pay it. So they specifically set it to that amount so that they would always get paid. You know, if they want to bring in a cybersecurity firm to try to fix it, then it will cost more to do that. And you can't decrypt it. We actually, it was funny, four years ago, uh, there was some ransomware that we could decrypt. One of, one of our researchers uh, figured out a way. They were using basically a basic XOR. They were not actually using real encryption. They didn't think that the end user would figure it out, but we figured out how to decrypt it. And so we were able to decrypt it for a while. We worked closely with the FBI. Whenever they saw those cases come in, they would say, hey, you know, talk to silence. They might be able to decrypt it. And then, unfortunately, um, some very nice gentleman you know, published a blog about it, and, and then the ransomware guys saw that we knew how to decrypt it. Not a silence employee, but someone else after fame published it, and then unfortunately, they stopped using that, so we weren't able to decrypt it anymore. Um, 
so the other piece, legacy software, outdated hardware, you know, that's a common problem, and many companies have that. Uh, downloads from emails or compromised websites, and then unpatched operating systems is, is another attack vector that they exploit. So I'm going to build this out, but again, this is a live you know, you know, ransomware message. We've changed it up a little bit. But if, if, if it's your job to pay an invoice, and I can look and see at what company, if, if company A on LinkedIn and see, hey, this is the person that pays the invoices. Let me shoot this to them. Please see the attached invoice, and they, they specifically say Microsoft Word document when it's not, it's actually you know, malware. And remit payment according to the terms listed at the bottom of the invoice. Let us know if you have any questions. And it's signed by someone that they know. This person, they actually knew who this, this you know, Adam Brewer, and again, we changed the name there, uh, is. So when they clicked on it, they were done. But the goal is to ensure that someone actually is going to click. You know, so they do everything they possibly can to research ahead of time to make sure they get that click. Because again, I, I'm in the wrong job. I could be somewhere making it rain, you know, making you know, 5000 a day. All I need is just one person to click, and I'm done. I'm out at the beach enjoying myself. So, you know, this is pretty common. We see this, you know, again, almost every day. This is another example of the payment negotiations. So this particular person said, hello, I'd like to inquire how much it, it would be to get my data back. The file IDs are, you know, and we will resolve this matter quickly as, as we can. They reply back and they say the price is 4,000 US dollars and minimum price for you. They're very specific. They don't want to do a lot of negotiations, so they said no discounts uh, for that amount. Um, and they will make sure that they will prove that they have those files. That's what they're, they're talking about in the middle. And then they give instructions on how to you know, decrypt it. So this is pretty common, a you know, common form letter, and that's what the communication looks like. You know, we also, depending on who the hackers are, we can negotiate some of the files and, and, and get a lower price. That's one of the techniques that we commonly use to try to get the price lower if they haven't de uh, encrypted the whole network. So the worst types of, of ransomware in, in 2012, you know, I'm not going to talk about Petra because I'm sure you guys heard you know, plenty of, about that. But you know, Locky has been pretty popular over the last two years. And, and it's getting, getting more popular uh, because now I'll talk about some of the techniques that they use with it. But here's what we see. So the ransomware families, so Bad Rabbit, and I'll, I'll read here. Uh, Bad Rabbit is, you know, it, it uses SMBs to communicate. Does everybody know what Mimikatz is? So Mimikatz, if, if you <laughs> get a chance, just Google it and go to the website. It's a free tool that uh, basically gets passwords out of memory that, that pen testers, hackers use. Uh, and so what they've done in Bad Rabbit is bundled in Mimikatz to harvest credentials. So once they harvest credentials, then they can use that and they'll send it back to the command and control server, um, or they can use that to spread throughout the, the, in, in the net network at that point and get more access to the more systems. And as a result of that, then the more systems you, you know, encrypt, the higher the ransom, and the more likely that someone's going to uh, pay it. And again, Adobe Flash. Uh, so defray, one of my favorites. So basic Word document is, is, is how it's usually done, kind of like the example we gave. But it kills all sources of backups and recovery, including remote backups. So if your backups are in the cloud, this automatically searches for that and kills it. They get, it gets credentials, and they're able to use that to log in remotely and, and destroy. So, you know, or they manually do it. You know, these are remote hackers. So if it's a large company and I want to charge a ton of money for that, that ransomware, I'm going to make sure your backups are dead. You do not have them before I send you that ransomware. So it's an orchestrated attack. You know, these attacks started with, hey, you clicked on something, get the pop-up. No. It would lay, lay dormant, spread throughout the environment on all, your, on, your, on all your endpoints, and then when they're ready and they know those backups are destroyed, boom. That happened to a how do, I, how do I sanitize this? To a a large hosting company that uh, let's just say hosted mining type information. A public company. That company was in the process about to, to file their you know quarterly reports. Those quarterly reports you know 
were delayed almost two months because they had to verify that the information had not been changed by the hackers. And their older business partners then knew about that they had been compromised because they had to communicate with them and, and go and talk to them and say, hey, our systems are down. And they asked why. They had to say ransomware. Uh, FBI was involved. Secret Service was involved. Um, but they had to go and validate all the data from their quarterly reports based upon that. Uh, Love Crip. So this, this uses a, a malicious CHM file uh, and, and PowerShell. So people think about malicious you know, executables as being bad, but if you're not looking at PowerShell as an attack, attack vector, that is something that is built into Windows. It's enabled on every single machine. Um, I don't need to create an executable. I can actually script it in PowerShell, my ransomware, and do just as much damage. So a lot of the, the commercial tools out there are looking for bad you know, executables, but not checking for PowerShell or scripts. And you can completely script out ransomware attacks. We will see more of this in the future, because as, as machine learning and AI gets more sophisticated, this is a way that you can potentially get away that part of it. That's why having script control type of capabilities are, are important. And then Locky. Um, we got inundated, I want to say about a year and a half ago, with um, hospitals being attacked. Again, if you, I don't know if you, you guys saw the Grey's Anatomy episode when they got attacked with ransomware. Uh, my wife was watching it, and, and she was asking me questions because they brought in the FBI. When the FBI came in, uh, she said, is that really what happens? No, the FBI actually doesn't come on site. You know, but they do get on the phone, and they will talk to you. And one of the questions you know, she asked was, you know, the FBI guy said, hey, you know, I know you want to pay this, but we don't pay ransomwares. That is the official statement, but the unofficial one, he actually clarified and said, but we have to sometimes. The official statement is no, they don't you know, pay hackers, but they have to. This is you know, you know, the highest level of encryption that is used. There's no way around it. You actually have to pay. But the official statement, again, is still that we don't. Um, and then Petra. Yeah, what was interesting about this one is where it overrides the master boot record uh, with the ransomware screen. So yeah, that it takes full control of that, that system. Uh, it, it, it was one of the hardest ones to, to fix. So I'll finish with what is your prevention strategy? How do you stop these types of attacks? And, and uh, again, this is open for Q&A. We have, have a mic here. Um, Let's talk through some of the experiences that you guys have had with ransomware or how you've, you've dealt with them. I think, you know, Cal, you mentioned you, you had an experience with ransomware. Yeah, you want to give the mic to him? Yeah, at uh, my company, we had a few workstations where uh, malicious documents had come in probably late 2016, mm -hmm. early 2017. So. Uh, the ransomware wasn't that sophisticated, so it only encrypted their workstation, so we were able to just kind of wipe it, give them a new one. But what's worrying is our SMB shares and backups. Do you have any tips or solutions to kind of protect those types of situations where they're connected to a network share or to make sure that those don't get hit? Yeah, and so what we see with the network share and, and SMB type connections, you know, if you're looking for the right things, then you're able to see the, that malicious activity. Because the first thing they got to do with these shares is get, get credentials. Once they get those credentials, then they'll use that to spread. So one of the techniques that, that we help our customers to identify is look for what we call um, anomalous activity associated with user profiles. So if, what you, and I'll, I'll take, the, let's take the Sony attack. It, it wasn't you know, ransomware, but it was similar. So, they got credentials they, you know, off of a, a phishing attack, and once they got those credentials, they built it into the malware, and then they logged into thousands of systems you know, with those credentials. And every time you log into a new system, it creates a new user profile. 
and also a new timestamp. So say the C white account, if that C white account is never logged into these systems, and yeah, I'm an administrator, but I've never logged into those systems, say at 3.30 a.m. in the morning, and then all of a sudden you see, why did C white log into these systems at 3.30 in the morning? Um, it could be for planting malware or ransomware, and that's one of the ways that, that it spreads for some of these big orchestrated attacks. So that's one of the ways you could look into you know, fixing it. Any other um, you know, comments? You in the front row, I gotta pick on you. Any thoughts or comments? <laughs> Any experience with ransomware? Not personally. Not personally, okay, good. Heather? Yeah. Similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you do anything around security awareness to educate that, that user or no? Not really. The time it was an individual. It was just an individual. Okay. Any other experiences? Did you guys want to share the ransomware? Questions, comments? Okay. I'll I'll finish with you know, one of the reasons why we have so much you know, experience with ransomware, there are a lot of companies that don't actually do incident response or incident containment as it relates to ransomware because it's nothing to do. You know, it, the goal is, is that if I'm a hacker, if I'm a ransomware guy, and I know, okay, here's a list of, in 2017, all the people that paid, and here's how much they paid. And if they don't have any preventative solution in place, then I'm going to hit them up in 2018. That's my reoccurring revenue stream. We've already started to see that happen, you know, from 2016 hacks, you know, to 2017 hacks. So the reason why we respond to incidents is because we can actually put something in place that's gonna, you know, contain those incidents and not let the ransomware malware, you know, attack happen. So that's why we've done over 300 cases in the, in the last year. And so, you know, one of the ways you can do it is definitely with looking at the malicious activity and compromised, you know, uh, hosts and, and, and accounts. The other way is to, you know, be able to block it at the endpoint. There are other ways you, you want to, you also want to look for, um, you know, unpatched systems because there, there are so many, um, you know, unknown attacks out there. And if you haven't properly patched your systems, then, that, uh, that is uh, also an attack vector that you want to make sure you, you cover. The last one I'll, I'll say is uh, think about your, your firewalls, your egress points, what type of uh, ports are allowed to go out and where they're allowed to go to, and you can lock down that activity as well because if they can't get their command and control to work, then they can't communicate back out. So yeah, think about where you do business. If you only do business, say, in the United States and nothing internationally, and you may want to block certain countries. I've seen people do that uh, as, as a strategy or log that activity and monitor it. Uh, if you have a good SIM, those logs will show a lot of the, the, the malicious traffic going out, and you'll be able to see, you know, why are we communicating to this IP address? Why is that host doing it? And so having that level of granularity is, 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 is pretty important to be able to determine what's happening. Okay. With that said, if there are no other questions, you know, thank you guys for your time this morning. Thank you.